Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, in the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be discussing about our learning experience uh, from teaching of purpose in Nepal. Uh, it is in the resource limited setting. <coughs> so, I work in the one of the largest tertiary level hospital in Kathmandu. It's called Tribune University Teaching Hospital. I'll be discussing about it more during my subsequent <coughs> slides. And these are two pictures you can see from Nepal. It's the Mount Everest over here, and this is a pretty famous temple called Swembu. So disclosures, uh, <coughs> for, for making me possible to come over here, uh, this, this group, EMUX, Emergency Medicine Ultrasound Group, has provided me with this uh, DCAPS, that is a, a scholarship, uh, for inaugural scholarship for, for the trainers from resource and setting for on focus. And also the uh, <coughs> Australian Institute of Ultrasound, AIU, has provided me with this advanced MNC medicine course. Uh, so I'm thankful to both of these groups for making it possible to come over here. So briefly about Nepal, it is a uh, landlocked country. Uh, it is located in the south, southern Asia, uh, with China in the northern side and India in the southern, eastern and western side. It has a land area of around 147,000 kilometers square, and the gross national product uh, GNI income is pretty low. It's around $730 annually, and around one fourth of the people they are living under the line of poverty. So, regarding the healthcare challenges in Nepal, I'll briefly mention about it. So, <coughs> about the number of healthcare professionals per population, if you see, it is around seven healthcare professionals per 10,000 population and World Health Organization defines a critical threshold of 23. So we are far below the actual requirement for the country. <coughs> so if we see the structure of healthcare system in the country, uh, the, the structure is uh, categorized, uh, divided into various level, primary, secondary, tertiary level, and there are some private hospitals. And the primary centers, uh, they are mainly run, run by the medical officers. These are the junior uh, graduates with very li limited amount of experience, maybe one year or less of experience. And also there are some ex ex auxiliary health workers. Um, they have very much minimal knowledge and experience about managing the patients. And in the secondary level also there are medical officers, tertiary, there are some medical officers and some general practitioners. So the common level of healthcare professions we find in all the levels is the, are the medical officers. And we have the experts very, very much sporadical. They are not present to, uh, 24 hours a day. <coughs> so all the limitations of the country, it is geographically challenged. There are a lot of hilly and mountainous areas. Development is very much tough. The pre-hospital and inter-hospital trans transport is not well developed. That we don't have proper system for transportations, and patients, sick patients, are they are either carried by the by, by human itself in the back, or by ambulance or air. Um, <coughs> there, there are a lot of problems with air transport and ambulance transport as well, and sometimes because of some natural casualties, like if there is landslide, if the roads are blocked, then the transportation is almost impossible. At sometimes, you can see over here. During the summer season, there is a lot of rain and there is inundation. The landslide came up and it has blocked the road. So it, it makes the transportation of patients very difficult in these scenarios. <coughs> and the sick patients, uh, they might be carried on the back by, other, by the relatives and they might need to walk a long distance, maybe one or two days, to reach the center. So what critical care services in Nepal? Again, it is very much limited. We have very much limited amount of beds, maybe around 500 beds in the whole country. Most of them, they are located in the central cities. Uh, there are very much very few in the peripheries. And most of the ICUs, they are under-equipped, both in terms of uh, manpower and also other uh, supporting structures and machines and monitors. They are very much limited. And the experts, there are very few. Critical experts are very few, and they are sporadically present. They are not present 24 hours. Again, uh, these ICU patients are also being managed by the medical officers. They have very much limited experience. So regarding the focus in Nepal, uh, how it started and how it is going on, I'll just uh, be discussing about briefly about it. <coughs> so before 2013, the focus training and workshop, uh, it was being conducted sporadically by some foreign groups. They would come, they would fly over to Kathmandu, stay for a few days, and they, they would go back and there was no training program as such in Nepal. Mm -hmm. And definitely it is a very new concept. Still it is a very new concept. People, most of the people, they are not yet aware that uh, non radiologists can also do the ultrasound on the patients and then they can make the difference. So after I finished my, um, finished my fellowship in Toronto in 2013, I went back and we felt the need of uh, a local group that can uh, start a training and that can sustain the training. They can provide the training in a more efficient and sustainable manner. So. Uh, uh, on 31st of August 2013, we did a first workshop in, in the name of Acute Care Ultrasound. 
And during that time, uh, there was a joint collaboration between the Department of Anesthesiology and Department of Radio Diagnosis and Imaging of uh, the Tribune University Teaching Hospital where I work. So this is the hospital where I work in Kathmandu. It is one of the largest tertiary level hospital. It's a referral center. We have over 650 beds and we have um, various level of training for the healthcare professionals starting from MBBS, MD and post MD courses uh, like DM and MCS trainings in various specialties including general practice, MNC medicine, critical care, radiology, we have all sort of training over here. So we thought that uh, one of these centers should take the lead in starting the training programs in Nepal. <coughs> so we kind of conducted three consecutive training programs over the duration of six months and after that uh, our workshop was recognized and it was endorsed by the Nepali Society of Critical Care Medicine. And on 2014, uh, we also said uh, we also had we made a, a sort of criteria for becoming a, becoming a trainer for our workshop. So initially, we started we started with around five or six uh, smaller small group of people, and with this um, criteria for becoming instructors, so we we kept on expanding the our core group of trainers. And in early 2016, we updated our all the contents. Initially, we had uh, very much limited amount of contents. Then it went up. Uh, we, we made it more evidence-based, and we added more images and pictures in our contents. And uh, this is Nepali Society of Critical Medicine, and this is our this is a logo of our workshop group. Uh, so far, we have conducted nine uh, aggregate ultrasound workshops, uh, but almost all of them were in the inside the Kathmandu Valley. And most of them were a part of the conferences, national conferences of the societies of anesthesiology, critical care, and MNC medicine. So during one of the um, workshops uh, during the MNC medicine conference, I got to meet uh, Dr. Brian O'Connell. And uh, with that, we had some collaboration, we had some thought processes, and the, the things came, came, kept on moving, and there was, it, then it was made, made possible for me to come over here. So far, we have trained more than 200 doctors, uh, medical officers, anesthesiologists, general practitioners, MNC physicians, intensivists, pediatricians, general physicians, all sort of uh, medical doctors, are, we have trained them so far. So now we have a pool of 21 trainers. So most of them are anesthesiologists, some are general practitioners, intensivists, and radiologists. And uh, we have eight hours workshop. It's a pretty s small one, just the one day course we are doing so far. And we have the lectures. Uh, we cover, cover the uh, focus concept, physics, neurology, vascular, uh, access and deep end thrombosis, uh, EFAS, lung, basic cardiac, neurologic, uh, during CPR, and rust protocol. And the second half is the hands-on, and we usually divide the participants into four groups uh, for the cardiac, for EFAS, vascular, and ROS, and they, they circulate within the stations. <coughs> so this is the picture from one of the workshops we were conducting. Uh, usually we use very small, these are portable machines, like this is the Sonocyte. And this is another picture from the workshop we are training, we are providing hands-on training for the participants. And we also we, we develop uh, these uh, tofu models for vascular access. We don't have the blue phantoms, so we get these tofus. And inside the tofu, we put this uh, Foley catheter, and we put some ink inside it. And it's, it, it, gives, it gives a pretty good uh, image, and it's, it's reasonably good for, for doing the practice. And these are the healthy volunteers we scan on. And this is a picture from one of the workshops we conducted. So there was a big earthquake. Uh, in 2015, uh, April 25th, uh, around 10, more than 10,000 people were dead and more than 22,000 they were injured and the healthcare system was totally overwhelmed. Many of the hospitals, they were non-functional and a few of the hospitals like the center I was working I had to deal with a ma major amount of uh, trauma patients. Uh, you can see it is totally overwhelmed, patients are lying outside in the uh, ground and there was a big crisis and this was, the, this was, this was my center and the, the usual MNC room couldn't handle the uh, crowd and the, the, all the patients were lying outside in the ground and we were managing the patients everywhere. So we thought the, uh, that the, there, can, there could have been a potential role of focus at the time as well because uh, everything was getting overwhelmed, the radiology was overwhelmed but we couldn't uh, implement at the time because we didn't have prior preparedness and planning for that and we didn't have adequate machines and we didn't have uh, adequately trained people. So it was not possible to apply focus at the time. Maybe we could have done better at the time if we were more prepared. So our group um, had been doing, doing a couple of research uh, ranging from some random, randomized trials, some uh, review papers, editorials, some case reports, and these are, these are a few of our publications. 
uh, regarding the barriers, what we are facing and how we may move forward. So uh, to, to exactly uh, know what, what barriers are being perceived by the participants as such, we did an online survey among all the participants of Agricultural Artisan Workshop. So we, we could find around 169 valid email address and through uh, email address we tried to get their uh, feedback and participation. 34 of them responded. Uh, there are the medical officers, anesthesiologists, intensivists, general practitioners, MSC physicians and internists. And we could see that uh, they found that most of the uh, participants, they found the works are very useful uh, for the daily practice. Uh, almost one third, they found it helpful. And you can see that uh, almost one fourth of the, uh, these participants, they are being using ultrasound in their daily practice. And one fourth, they are often using it. And almost 40 percent, they are sometimes using ultrasound machines. So regarding uh, the barriers they are facing for applying the point of care ultrasound in their daily <coughs> practice, they find that um, access to ultrasound machine was one of the biggest barriers. Almost 50 percent of the participants, they think that because of lack of um, effective access to the ultrasound machine, they are not being able to apply in their daily practice. Almost 50 percent, they found that lack of supervision is a big problem for them. Because maybe because our workshop is too short, we just do one day workshop and we don't expect them to become the perfect, perfect people. So they, they are a little hesitant uh, applying their findings in their daily practice. They are not getting supervised. We don't have much trained people to supervise, supervise them. So this was another barrier. And lack of knowledge, and 35% they perceived. Lack of time, 30%. Uh, we have a significantly less amount of trained people. So people are very busy to apply point of care ultrasound in their daily practice. So these are the, usual, these are the barriers uh, our participants have faced so far. There are a couple of limitations of the sur survey because uh, the number of respondents was, was pretty small and most of the respond responders, and they have been working in the larger hospital of the capital. Uh, they are more equipped with both equipments and bore manpower and uh, the findings may not be extrapolated to, the, to that of Afsar Kathmandu. Afsar Kathmandu, we can expect the condition to be further worse. Uh, and next thing is that we didn't test for the knowledge retens retention. We don't know whether they are retaining the knowledge after some time or not. So even the trainers, we are also facing some barriers uh, while doing the courses. So uh, what, what we felt, uh, I tried to gather the uh, feedback from the group, group of our trainers and they find that, and they, sometimes they find difficulty retaining the competency because again, for the trainers also, the ultrasound, access to ultrasound machine is not regular, not universal. Um, and they are, they are finding difficulty managing the ultrasound machine for the courses. So we don't have, um, a very much established setup for the workshops. So we do, do it on our own in initiatives. And for that, we often request the radiology department, uh, intensive care department, and the uh, um, makers of ultrasound to provide us with some machines. So that is also not easy. Also, uh, we felt the need of advanced courses because some people, especially in our center, they have been using the ultrasound more routinely. And they think that the ultrasound advanced course is going to help them and potentially it can produce more future leaders for ultrasound. And also we felt a need of multidisciplinary team because it is mainly being uh, conducted by the core group of uh, predominantly anesthesiologists and intensivists. Maybe we need to involve more uh, MNC physicians and general practitioners. That is what we are feeling. And also we, we, find, we find a need to extend it outside Kathmandu because we are doing almost all the courses inside of Kathmandu. Uh, some of the par respondents, participants, they also mentioned that it should be done outside of Kathmandu so that they don't need to travel to the Kathmandu for the course. Also, lack of incentive is another problem because uh, we are not doing this works for any profit. We just charge around 10 to 15 dollars for the participants for the one-day course, and it is basically meant uh, for the purpose of uh, lunch and some stationaries. That's it. <laughs> so all the um, trainers they are they are participating and working voluntarily. Also, next is about the lack of awareness about uh, about the point of care of sound in healthcare professionals. We find that. Uh, still, uh, the concept is very much new, and still they don't think that a non radiologist can make the difference, they can scan the people. So this is the machine we are having in our center. Uh, so we are having this machine since only last one year. Before that, we were still struggling to get the machine in our center. So what are the possible solutions and future plannings? Uh, so we are plan planning to extend the workshop outside Kathmandu. That is a need, I think. We are, conducting, we are planning to conduct one and a half day workshop. The one day is too short. We have very short duration of hands-on. We will try to increase the duration of hands-on so that the participants, they, they get more confident about using it. 
and we are planning for to generate a larger team of trainers, uh, including the experts from various specialties. Uh, and we are trying to improve the awareness uh, availability of the machine by creating awareness. Uh, we try to convince the authorities. Initially, even in our center, we didn't have a dedicated ultrasound machine in our ICU. So every time we used to conduct the workshops in our center, we used to invite the hospital authorities, we, we used to invite the directors, we used to tell them the significance of ultrasound, we used to show them what we are doing, what we are training, and finally we could convince them and get the ultrasound machines. And also, uh, possibly, we can in incorporate uh, point of care ultrasound in the disaster management in the national policy. So we're also planning for a book on point of care ultrasound, and that will be basically case-based and will target basically the medical officers because these are the people who will be dealing the most of the patients uh, in emergency and intensive care. So I think unless we train these people, first-line healthcare people, we are not going to make the difference. Also, we are planning to create a website where we can share the learning materials, where we can put up, where we can upload the new guidelines and recent papers, where we can gather the feedback from the participants, and where we can have a common forum for discussion of some interesting cases. And also, we are planning for the advanced course, maybe with collaboration with international groups, maybe with AIU. We are thinking about it, and also, of course, collaboration is going to be very much important because it is still very much primitive in Nepal. And we need collaboration for the ex improvement of the existing course, for developing the advanced course, for the book project, for possible support with ultrasound machine and fundings. So, uh, something about telemedicine in Nepal. Um, uh, th th there is a small group of dedicated peoples uh, who have started telemedicine recently, maybe in the last couple of two or three years. And basically, they are treating not, not the acute patients at the moment. And, uh, they are connecting this Kathmandu is over here and in the far western region, which is very much remote, and the, the patients would have to travel days to reach the center. So a few doctors, um, they have trained the paramedics in Kathmandu. The, the paramedics would go back to the village, and they would uh, interview the patients over there and do the direct telemedicine, and they have, they have started treating the patients. And it is being run by the solar, solar power uh, uh, generated, uh, uh, they're on the computer with the help of solar power, and they're using the um, cellular mobile internet for the internet access within these two centers. And possibly we may be able to integrate this uh, telemedicine concept into the point of care ultrasound, especially for the patients in the remote locations. We might train the people in the, in the valley, send them to the periphery, and possibly we might be able to manage the acute patients as well with point of care ultrasound. So we are, we are also discussing about possibly integrating the point of care ultrasound in the curriculum of academic programs like the DM MNC Medicine, DM Critical Care, and MD General Practice, NSCC Internal Medicine, and General Surgery. And we are also thinking about doing the refresher courses for the participants who have participated in the previous courses. We see plenty of barriers, but still we can see, we, we, we think that there is possibly a bright side beyond it. Thank you.